this practice does is it teaches you to deliberately turn off your thinking and to relax your body. NSDR is terrific at allowing people to learn to shift their state. Within the crucible of adversity, where stress seeks to shatter our resolve, Huberman's NSDR approaches ignite a fiery determination, empowering us to confront our demons head on. Armed with the transformative power to rewrite our stress-laden narratives and emerge victorious. And really allowing the mind to enter one of these pseudo-sleep states. We know from work in my laboratory and work that I'm doing with David Spiegel's laboratory, as well as work from other labs, that that state of shallow nap or shallow sleep done in waking allows the brain to, and the person, to get better at turning off their thoughts and falling asleep in the evening. Against the backdrop of a society teetering on the brink of emotional collapse, Huberman's NSDR techniques manifest as a lifeline of hope, guiding us through the treacherous labyrinth of stress, offering a roadmap to resilience, and illuminating the path to reclaiming our peace of mind. But non-sleep deep rest is allowing your system to drop into states of, of real calm that allow you to get better at falling asleep later, and they can be very restorative for cognitive and motor function. There's at least one study um, out of Denmark that shows that the basal, the basal ganglia, which is an area of the brain that's involved in motor planning and action. In the face of stress-induced despair, where hope flickers like a dying ember, Huberman's NSDR approaches breathe life into the ashes, rekindling our spirits and fueling the flames of resilience, reminding us that within the crucible of stress lies the transformative power to forge unbreakable strength. Um, there are several very good papers that were published in the last few years in the journal Cell Report showing that short naps and NSDR, I should say, has some good science to support it, um, accelerates neuroplasticity and learning, especially if you take that nap within four to six hours after a very intense learning bout. Amidst a world caught in the relentless grip of stress, Huberman's NSDR strategies serve as a beacon of light, piercing through the darkness and leading us toward a profound understanding of our own inner workings, granting us the power to unravel the knots of stress that bind us and embracing a life of unwavering tranquility. Uh, but those periods of deep rest allow you to consolidate the material much more quickly and more deeply. And then you mentioned that there's sometimes also a period in the afternoon. So mm -hmm. definitely nourish, take care of your email, take care of your social connections. These are important things to be able to continue to do work. In the grand tapestry of human existence, where stress threatens to unravel our very fabric, Huberman's NSDR approaches emerge as threads of fortitude, weaving together resilience, mindfulness, and self-compassion, inviting us to embark on a transformative journey towards inner peace and an unwavering embrace of life's challenges. And really allowing the mind to enter one of these pseudo-sleep states. We know from work in my laboratory and work that I'm doing with David Spiegel's laboratory, as well as work from other labs, that that state of shallow nap or shallow sleep done in waking allows the brain to, and the person, to get better at turning off their thoughts and falling asleep in the evening. Yeah, so non-sleep deep rest, NSDR, is an acronym that I coined because it encompasses a lot of practices that are not meditation per se but that bring the brain and body into a state of relaxation and focus. So hypnosis is one variant of NSDR. There are other variants of NSDR. You can just look these up and you'll find them. And I think that they've caught on and that the Google, um, the CEO of Google uh, is an avid practitioner of NSDR because it has this amazing ability to reset your energy levels and focus. Whereas with meditation, many people find meditation hard. And part of the reason they find it hard is that it requires focus. NSDR is a state which is very calm and relaxing. You don't have to work too hard. You're just listening to a script. Whereas most forms of meditation, not all, but most forms of meditation involve cranking up the activity in your prefrontal cortex and trying to see your thoughts as opposed to thinking your thoughts or um, focus on your breath, but then third personing yourself in some respect. And that's work. And so many people who meditate quite intensely feel more exhausted. Now, that doesn't mean that meditation doesn't have any utility, but it's distinctly different than NSDR. And I think that people are working, certainly the CEO of Google, I have to imagine, is working very hard and using his forebrain. If he's going to have 20 or 30 minutes to take a break, he should, and I think this is what he's doing, he should go out for a jog and not listen to anything and just kind of let his mind wander or sit there in a chair and just zone out or do NSDR. The problem is people are not that good at shifting states. 
we are all actually pretty good at, be, even people with, with severe ADHD, we did an episode about this, can become hyper-focused on things that they actually enjoy. One of the absolute most powerful tools that has come into my life in the last decade that my lab works on, and there are people in psychiatry at Stanford that are also working on, is a practice that I call non-sleep deep rest, which is NSDR. Non-sleep deep rest is an umbrella term that admittedly I created to include things like yoga nidra, which is actually doesn't involve any downward dogs or handstands or anything. Yoga nidra is an ancient practice. There's some scripts online. Many of them are very good. You go on YouTube, you can find one of these scripts. They're totally cost-free. Put in headphones or put your phone next to you. You lie down and it's a 10 to 30 minute script that walks you through a progressive relaxation of your nervous system. There's some breathing. Some of them have intentions and that kind of thing. For that reason, um, uh, some friends of mine at a company called Made For made a free resource. Um, you can just look up NS, NSDR, um, Nancy Sam uh, Dog ro Robot, NSDR, uh, and Made For. And there's one there that removes the kind of intentions and other elements. What this practice does is it teaches you to deliberately turn off your thinking and to relax your body. And it makes it easier for people to access falling asleep and to, more easily de-stress. Now, the question is when to do NSDR. You can do NSDR first thing in the morning if you ever wake up and you did not get enough sleep. I often wake up and feel, ah, I didn't get enough sleep. I'll do a 30 minute NSDR and I come out of that feeling terrific as if I got a full night's sleep. And I do this almost every day at some point. I might do it in the afternoon or if you wake up in the middle of the night and you're having trouble falling back asleep, I highly recommend doing this because even if it doesn't put you back to sleep, it's better than being awake and ruminating. And you're teaching yourself to fall back asleep. NSDR is terrific at allowing people to learn to shift their state. And I actually would venture to argue that part of the value of meditation and exercise is the actual state that you get into in deep meditation or exercise. But just as valuable is the transition that you have to take yourself through from one state of mind to the other and then back again. I, when I look, you know, David Goggins, he always seems to come up, but he because he represents so many important things, drive, determination, override of emotional state, going from being a 300 pound plus person to a fit person through, he's never revealed anything substantial about what he ate or what he didn't eat. He basically says like, listen, run a lot, eat less, right? <laughs> yeah. um, but what's remarkable is so much of what he says is about those transitions, about taking oneself from a state of, I don't want to, to scruffing oneself and like you're going to do it anyway and then being able to carry that into into regular life so to speak there's something about that um sleep state that allows the brain to rewire and most of the rewiring and neuroplasticity occurs during deep sleep but also during these short sleep bouts um, that we call naps or nsdr so i'm a i'm a huge fan and yeah my evening is basically uh, just trying to take things down a notch um and everything's a little bit quieter, a little bit mellower. Uh, occasionally I'll get a, a bout of focused writing in during that one hour peak or something of that sort. I'm just really trying to taper everything. I try not walk the dog at night, but it, sometimes the dog needs to walk. So it's not that I, you know, I'm, I'm super strict about this. Occasionally I will um, go you know, take the dog out for a walk or watch a movie, but most of the time it's, it's a progressive mellowing toward the evening and then in the morning, um, you know, it's, it, we started pretty early today um, and I, I'm up and I'm up and at them and all day long I'm going, going, going. One thing that's really, um, I should mention, if people are having an afternoon crash, uh, one thing they can do to support themselves is to um, delay their morning caffeine for 90 to 120 minutes after waking. The longer you're awake, the more there's a buildup of a, of a molecule in the brain and body called adenosine. And that's sort of a sleepiness molecule, if you will. Caffeine inhibits adenosine function. It does this through a, it basically parks in the receptor and prevents adenosine from working. So if you wake up in the morning you're, and you're blitzing caffeine like I am this morning, um, but I've been up for a while, you're drinking caffeine straight out the gate. What happens is whatever residual adenosine was in your system is still floating around. You've blocked where it can bind to the adenosine receptor, so it's not making you sleepy.